Welcome into the NFL on Fox podcast presented by Verizon. I'm Dave Hellman. And y'all, we are Lambo leaping into week four. I don't know how this happens every year. We spend eight months getting hyped for the season. We blink and we're reaching near the quarter point of the NFL season. It starts tonight. The Detroit Lions going up to Lambeau Field to face the Green Bay Packers in a division matchup. We'll get to that thrilling divisional matchup. The last game of the 2022 season, we renew the rivalry in week four of 2023. Before we jump into that preview, There has been something that's on my mind, and clearly I'm not alone. And this is the type of stuff that happens when you have these marquee games and these standalone windows. If you go back a couple days, you remember the Philadelphia Eagles beating the Tampa Bay Bucks on Monday Night Football. And if the Eagles are playing in a standalone primetime game, it's bound to become a talking point. The short yardage play, the rugby scrum, the fourth and goal, whatever you want to call it, it's it's a topic of conversation. It leads to conversations about whether it's fair, about how the Eagles do it, and apparently about what it's called. Because as it turns out, I wasn't the only one that was bummed out by the choice of phrase that's being used to describe this play. This is my teaser setup for my weekly chat with NFL on Fox's own Peter Schrager. We had a burning desire to talk about the Jalen Hurts play not going to call it that other thing. You'll see why when we get into it, we talked about that, talked about what I think is the biggest game in the NFL this week. And we also chatted a little more about this weekly soap opera that I'm calling as the Jets quarterback room turns. We can work on the title. We'll workshop that, but really productive chat with Peter Peter Schrager this week. Check it out. All right, welcome into week four's edition of Peter Schrager's Cheat Sheet presented by Honda. I'm joined by... Fox Sports NFL insider Peter Schrager. Peter, I got to be honest with you, your your wonderful television program, it airs a little early on the West yeah. Coast. But I, you know, I I I see everything. I I've got an eye on all things NFL and what better place to start than your I, I we can call it a rant, I don't know, yeah, but rant. I, I think let's let's talk about this short yardage play that has everybody so up in arms about the Philadelphia Eagles. I saw you talking about it on Good Morning Football, and I, I I watched the clip, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is good stuff. Let's get into this. So, it's a good, good uh, place to start. Yeah. Uh, so this rugby scrum play that the Eagles run that they've been doing now for two years, and it's an unstoppable play, and there's very little football grace to it, but it is a quarterback sneak, and it is completely legal, it was reviewed by the competition committee this offseason, and they decided to not not get rid of it. It's not illegal. And the Eagles have just continued it on. And it's to the ire of many opposing teams and many opposing fans that say it's BS. They shouldn't be able to do that. It's I have no say and no voice on that. What I don't like is that Amazon's Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet tried shoving a nickname at us that we have not asked for. They called it the Tush Push. I think the Tush Push is a is a terrible nickname. I think it has nothing to do with the Eagles. I think it was just out of thin air. They call it the tush push. Um, That's, that's not something anyone from Philadelphia asked for. It's not something anyone from the other media outlets wanted. And then I've seen it used in subsequent broadcasts since I want to put a stop to it. And today on good morning football, I went through a, a deep dive on Reddit. And sometimes you don't want to go on a deep dive on Reddit. If you want to search your name and be depressed for the next uh, 10 months, go deep dive your it's name. It's a Reddit. dangerous place. Yeah, it's a dangerous, dangerous place. place. Dangerous place. However, the Eagles Reddit page, our backslash Eagles, had an entire thread dedicated to a different nickname for this play. And that nickname would be the Brotherly Shove. And there is a grassroots movement amongst Eagles fans to have this fully replace this tush push nonsense that Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet decided to just name. And now all of a sudden the rest of us have to call it tush push. Um, They have made a movement to call it the brotherly shove. And this was on the depths of the internet, a place a lot of people don't like, like lingering. I brought it to light on good morning football. And then sure enough, two hours later, Nick Sirianni was asked about the brotherly shove in his media availability. And he said he was all for it. And he wants it. And that Merrill Reese, the voice of the Eagles for nearly 40 years, should be calling it the brotherly shove on air. Now, since then, I have gotten thousands of tweets 
dozens of texts with people with suggestions for another nickname. Brotherly shove was not good enough. That brotherly <laughs> shove, it doesn't really encapsulate just what this is. It has no inclusion of the name Hertz, which is such a powerful name for puns and nicknames. Um, the one that really stuck with me came from a, a viewer on Twitter, and I, I apologize not having the Twitter handle on me. We love the song Love Hurts by Nazareth. I got this one. Shove Hurts. Shove Hurts. And you know the song. No. It's a power oh, no. ballad. And if you think about it, it's technically a shove of Hurts. It's actually oh, an no. action. Um, that doesn't seem to have the same momentum, but brotherly shove. I'm all for a nickname for this play. I hate just calling it like the rugby play that the Eagles run, but I'm not going to say the word tush for the rest of my existence on air. I will not. I've got a few thoughts about this. Number one, I'm really, uh, I admire you for doing this because I'm, I, I'm ashamed a little bit because I, I, I don't like that name. Your, your, your point on good morning football was so true. Like who, what about the word tush has anything to do with the city of Philadelphia? Disgusting. Like, Blue collar city, rough and tumble city. Absolutely not. But I think, you know, we record a recap of the Thursday night game right after it ends. And for lack of a better thought, I just was like, oh, yeah, you know, they run the tush push a couple yes. times. Like, it's so easy to just fall into what somebody else suggests for you. And you said, hell no, no. we're not doing this. Nip it in and the tush. End it. I, I I admire you for fighting back because it's so easy to just roll with it. And that's not okay. So good on you. I, I think brotherly shove is perfect because it's kind of, it's kind of timeless. Like shove hurts. I think you kind of have to sing it to get people to understand it. Whereas mm -hmm. brotherly shove, everybody knows Philly's the city of brotherly love. I think it's, and, and, you know, hurts in that offensive line there, there's a bond there. I, I think it's amazing. I'm very, I'm thrilled about this. And if Sirianni and Merrill Reese are talking about it, I think it's only a matter of time. And I actually, I kind of, I, I think people try too hard to give everything a nickname, but I do think this is worthy of a nickname. Like this is a play that is kind of, it looks like it's going to define this era of Philly football, at least until they outlaw it, which that's they a different ultimately discussion. Will. I, and it's funny. It's like, <clears throat> everyone is so, <laughs> everyone becomes a sports media analyst and we watch these broadcasts as a collective. So everyone's <clears throat> in the same time tweeting about these broadcasts and what the announcers say. And I, I don't mind all the Taylor Swift puns that are going to be shoved down our throat for the next two months of chiefs games. I don't, I think it's clever. I think it's fun. It's inclusive. If Ian Eagle wants to go blank space or, if if Kevin Burkhart wanted to mention that she's an Eagles fan because of the Eagles t-shirt Lear, I, I'm okay. Collinsworth and Tariko have their whack this weekend. You know, they got the Chiefs. We're gonna get some <laughs> Taylor Swift references. Don't, don't, sure. don't worry about it. I'm okay with that stuff. It's the nickname being forced upon me from a, a broadcast crew, Herb Street Michaels, which is rather new to me. I I don't that's not Chris Berman making that nickname. Kirk right. Herb Street, you know, Mike. Those guys, they don't, I don't have, they don't have the equity to kind of just label something. So I'm going to say, I'm going to go with the fresh one from the deep, 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 dark places of Reddit. I'm going to go with those guys. Hey, give the, give the fans a voice. You know, you have the platform to make this happen. And it's I, the least I can do the other thing. And I, I think you're right. I think this eventually gets outlawed. But I think that's, I think that's so soft. Like that's, that's my other thought on this. Like I really, I really hope it doesn't because, you know, as, as a longtime college football guy, I got Patrick Peterson behind me right here. One thing I love about college football that I don't think the NFL has enough of is it's just, it's such a melting pot of styles and different types of offense. And, oh, like you got to prepare for the triple option this week because that's what the service academies do. You don't see that as often in the NFL. It's very homogenized and I, I don't like the idea of taking out something so unique to a certain team. And if you don't like it, A, stop it. B, nobody's stopping you from doing it. I, I went and looked just – I was curious. I counted 22 teams in the NFL that have a quarterback that is capable of doing something like this. Like Jalen Hurts ain't the only guy in the league that can squat 600 pounds. Miss me. Josh Allen can't do this? Really? I don't buy it. I absolutely don't buy it. Like, if you don't like it so much, incorporate it into your own game plan. I tell you, the Colts tried it. 
and they didn't convert it. No, a couple teams. I think the Giants tried it. Giants the tried other, it. Yeah. Did not convert okay. it. Get better. Get get in the lab on a Thursday when you do short yardage and red zone and get better. I don't buy that Philly is magically the only team that can do this. Dude, uh, you know, it's funny because the Commanders play the Eagles this weekend. It's on Fox. The Commanders have outside of maybe, oh, let's see here, the Eagles and the Niners. And maybe you can throw in a couple. The Commanders have an amazing defensive line littered with first round picks. I mean, you're talking Payne and Allen and Chase Young. I have no doubt that Philly's going to run this play right up their gut. And and if they can't successfully, stop it, of yeah. course. And if the Niners <laughs> can't stop it, and if the Cowboys can't stop it, and if this week the Buccaneers couldn't stop it, maybe they're just better than you. And maybe they're stronger than you. And maybe that's why they're the defending NFC champions. Brotherly shoving it right down your throats as yes. the Philadelphia Eagles like to do. I mentioned Josh Allen. I do. I want to touch on uh, for me, the most interesting storyline this weekend, and I think it's it's great for the NFL. We all love the Chiefs. Everybody loves the Chiefs. But a a game of the century of the week sort of game that has nothing to do with the Kansas City Chiefs, and that is the Miami Dolphins going up to take on the Buffalo Bills. I didn't realize, honestly, you get so swept up in the week-by-week week grind of the season. I had no idea this was coming up on the schedule until Sunday night. And I'm immediately like, let's fast forward to next week. Like, I got to see this game. I can't freaking wait. Yeah, Bills are 8-2 and two the last 10 games against the Dolphins. The Dolphins beat them in the heat last year down in Miami, and then the Bills beat them twice more playoffs and, of course, the end of the regular season on a Saturday night game. Josh Allen historically owns the, the, the Dolphins. He's had great success against them. But here comes the Dolphins team that's number one in the league in every offensive quarter, uh, every offensive category. They scored 70 points last week and they're underdogs. I find this game fascinating. And what an opportunity for the Dolphins to make a statement here that this is not some fluke and this is different than last year. I, you know, I, I'm shocked that even though the Bills have historically been better and have won those games, I don't know. The Dolphins came in there with Skylar Thompson last year in the playoffs and lost by three. Um, mm. Miami is simmering. I, I love watching this offense and I love watching the way they operate. And it's not like they can only win shootouts. They beat New England and they only scored 24 points, but they still got that offensive stuff going. McDaniel's been um, a really cool story. I think if you were to do coach of the year right now, I, I would think he's your coach of the year. And mm. it's, it's because for me, he's always been there. Like he was with Wash, he was with Washington, the same crew as LaFleur and McVay and Shanahan. And then he was with, the Browns with Shanahan. Then he was at the Falcons with Shanahan. Then he waited his turn in San Francisco for five, six, seven years with Shanahan until he finally got an interview with the Dolphins, a job that was supposed to go to Sean Payton, it sounded like. And then Payton and and uh, Brady, that whole thing fell apart. And it was almost like Mike McDaniel. And only two years in, he's being considered, you know, the same breath as Andy Reid, Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, and the rest of the offensive masterminds. So, Let's see. Sean McDermott, head coach who calls defense. Mike McDaniel, offensive coach who also is the head coach. Like, this is an awesome showdown. Two great quarterbacks. And I love it's the rare one o'clock game that has great significance. Which I was going to bring that up is I love even the best teams can get hidden by the one o'clock, 10 a.m. window. Yeah. Because the Bills, you know, we we're pumping up my Dallas Cowboys for going 70 and 10 in the first two weeks, 70 points and 10 points allowed. The Bills, I believe, have outscored their last two opponents 75 to 13 since they lost that week one game. And at least by Bills standards, like we're just not talking about how absolutely dominant they've looked. And the defense, especially, like without Von Miller, the pass rush looks phenomenal. These these young linebackers, I can't wait to see that. Miami made Miami made Denver's linebackers look so foolish. And then you look at this game, you see a guy like Terrell Bernard playing awesome. out of his mind. Awesome. Cannot wait to see, uh, you know, if this is a byproduct of the Bills beating up on some teams that weren't ready for it or if the Bills defense is, is ready to take another step. Has, has there been a more overlooked week three win than what the Bills did to Washington? It was 38 no. 38 nothing against a team that was undefeated and getting a lot of hype and the enemy and all this stuff. And then at the end of the game with nothing to play for, Riverboat Rock. Bad little field goal. <laughs> it's a field goal, which is always to me like a whimper. Like, uh, all right. Uh, I guess you don't want to get shut out, but uh, like, okay, so they lost 38 to three, but that was a destruction by the Bills. And it was so quiet, quiet because A, it was buried in a one o'clock window by what the Dolphins were doing. And then Taylor Swift showed up on our screens and it was like, all right. Yeah, good else. point. Yeah. 
very quickly, one one other thing I just think is really funny about this is I, I looked this up. We're getting we're getting Bills Dolphins in Buffalo in late September, and we get the rematch in Miami in January. So like. It's the exact opposite of last year. Like, I, 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 I wonder if the schedule makers are throwing these teams a bone. Like, okay, Buffalo, we're not going to make you play in 100-degree heat, and we're not going to make the Dolphins play in the snow, which kind of bums me out personally. Like, I like seeing teams deal with that stuff. I was on the sidelines for that Saturday night game in the snow. Week 15, I think it was last year, Bills versus Dolphins. Jalen Phillips comes out absolutely shirtless and ripped and is like, I'm going to represent the Dolphins. We're here in zero-degree weather. I got hit in the head with a snowball. That was wonderful. Um, it was <laughs> it was a game in the elements. And then the, the flip side to your point, that week three game last year was 6,000 degrees. That's the game where you saw Ken Dorsey smash his tablet up top. Um, and the Dolphins just used that home field advantage, which was quite evident in that Denver Broncos game last week too, where it was so hot on the Broncos side. They had an, a, an air-conditioned tent over the bench. Didn't help them. They still lost by 50. Uh, the, the, the schedule makers flipped the script a little bit. So you got your your September game in Buffalo and then your January game in Miami. It's a great point, Dave. I, I wonder if that's like the great neutralizer. Yeah, I guess. I mean, we'll get, we should get to see both teams do what they do best, which is exciting. I feel like the jets have been a, a constant theme of this segment since we started doing it. I feel a little bit guilty for continuing to bring it up, but I think it's, it's necessary every week. Trevor Simeon is now a New York jet. I, I can't imagine they would get him playing time against the Kansas City Chiefs, no, but he won't. He won't dress this week. But I, I, he's in the building, which for me starts the clock on when. When can he play? When is he ready to play? No, I'm not trying to disrespect Zach Wilson too much. You can but disrespect Zach Wilson. I can't imagine he's going to play well enough to change anybody's mind against the reigning champs. And so my only question for this team now is, how long do you have to wait before Trevor Simeon gets his shot? I would assume. It's the game after this one. The Jets have three more primetime games after this one, so buckle up. Uh, <laughs> Simeon, Simeon was like a, uh, it's almost like a, how do I put this? It's like a bone to like the Jets fans, like as like if they were dogs, like, all right, you guys want a veteran quarterback? We brought, we brought a live body in. Like he hasn't won a game since 2017. I, I don't think Trevor Simeon is what Jets fans had in mind when they clamor for these veteran quarterbacks, but there was nobody out there. There really wasn't. Yeah. And the Jets don't have any money to spend really. So, Hey, it's funny, you know, I said this earlier in the week, and there's a lot of ways this can go, but when they signed Randall Cobb and Alan Lazard and Dalvin Cook and Nicole Hardman, it was all with this expectation that you got Rodgers under center and that this is going to be compliments to what he can run. And Once Rodgers goes down, it's like a house of cards. The whole thing falls apart. And these guys, they're not, they're not game breakers who they got. They've got Garrett Wilson. Like the receivers don't look as good. The offensive line doesn't look as good. The offensive line doesn't have any depth. They spent their money on Dalvin cook when in truth, they probably could have used some offensive linemen to be back up there. And they didn't sign a veteran backup in the case that Rodgers got hurt all off season so that there was nobody left when it's now just Zach Wilson, Tim Boyle, and eventually Trevor Simeon, it's bleak. And now Joe Namath has come out and said that he would trade Zach Wilson. Um, there's this other thing that like Jets fans are voicing their opinions on message boards, but also on the local radio, which I'm here in New York. Rogers is on McAfee commenting from, from Malibu where he's rehabbing. And like, does that help at all that Rogers is in California giving his commentary on the Jets while the rest of these Jets guys are in the building and, and they're working. And of course they worship Rogers. He's, he's the man and all that stuff, but it's like, it, it just feels like all this great stuff that built up all July, all August, the pregame of week one right now. It's like, now there's a, there's a microscope on the jets and every positive is looking like, Oh, wait a second. There was a, yeah, but at the end of this thing, if Rogers was hurt, uh, eventually Rogers will get back in the building. And I think they'll really, really appreciate his presence. Um, but right now, you know, with the chiefs coming to town and who knows the national audience it's going to get because on the rare chance or not so rare chance that Taylor Swift is in the audience too. And everyone's going to be watching this as if it's, you know, the state of the union or something of that nature, as far as a national event, like if the jets lose 50 to nothing. Like, eh, I don't know. Like, I don't know what, what you're going to talk about on Monday. I've been saying it this entire time. I just think the noise is going to get louder and louder and louder. I, hindsight's twenty twenty. I get that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be too mean. But when you know that your quarterback is forty, uh, maybe the Jets should have tried a little harder to cover themselves there. And and I get that Zach Wilson was drafted number two overall, but 
everybody in the building should have known like, eh, do we really want Zach Wilson doing this for more than a game or two? As, as someone who has lived in New York most of my life and someone who is very close to a lot of Jets fans, the ethos this whole summer was like, I'm going to allow myself to believe. I'm going to allow myself to have hope. And they all did buy in. And then the second Rodgers went in, the, the feeling now for a lot of these Jets fans, it's not anger. It's not even disappointment. <clears throat> it's shame because they allowed themselves to have that ray of sunshine. They allowed themselves to believe. And that's just not how it goes for Jets fans. And that's a terrible way to live as a sports fan. But that's where they're at right now. I mean, I feel like a lot of Jets fans are also New York Mets fans and and Knicks fans. And that is a I, walk. I, a walk. I feel for you. I'm sorry. I don't know why it has to be this way, but it does. I I don't know what else to say. Yeah. As uh, the comedian Hank Azaria is a diehard Jets, Mets, Knicks fan. And I had him on uh, my podcast a couple of weeks ago. And he said, at some point, you you just you just ask yourselves, why can't we have nice things? (laughs) One day, one day, maybe, you know, hopefully Aaron Rodgers attacks this rehab and yeah. And we can try this thing all over again next year, but I just don't see it happening. Peter Schrager, really, really enjoy the time, man. Appreciate you so much. We will see you next week. The one bit of news about this jet situation that Peter and I didn't get to was word coming out on Tuesday that Colin Kaepernick had written a letter to Joe Douglas, Jets general manager in the Jets organization, asking to to make the Jets practice squad to join the organization uh, a to give them an accounting for where he is and what he can do. He states in the letter that, that he has been training diligently for the past six years. Again, we know on and off throughout the last few years, Kaepernick has pleaded with the NFL to get another shot since his playing career ended. And on top of that, I thought the interesting point that uh, a guy with a history of being mobile, like Colin Kaepernick, could help the Jets get ready in practice to face some of the more mobile quarterbacks on their schedule, whether that's Patrick Mahomes, whether that's Jalen Hurts or Russell Wilson. I think the news that the Jets have signed Trevor Simeon probably closes the book on this. And I also think the media spotlight that comes with Colin Kaepernick probably precludes the Jets from doing this. I don't buy that as it comes to a team like the New York Jets. I mean, we talk so much about the spotlight That is on New York sports, the scrutiny of the media there, how everything is nationwide and occasionally even a worldwide story. We're seeing that play out right now with how much we're talking about the quarterback situation there. I don't buy it as a viable excuse, especially if Kaepernick isn't starting right away. Um, But I would be surprised to see that happen. I do think this story is not over and maybe, maybe not as it pertains to Colin Kaepernick, but I think Trevor Simeon will eventually get a chance to play. I just don't think Robert Sala can keep the support of his locker room if he doesn't give somebody else a shot. Trevor Simeon has 30 career starts, even if he hasn't won in a few years, as as Peter Schrager pointed out. I think at some point you got to try something new. And at the risk of sounding like a hater, I'm not convinced that is going to work. Simeon didn't light the world on fire as a member of the Chicago Bears when he got opportunities last year. And remember... It's not even October yet. I think this is going to be a twisting, turning, probably agonizing experience for the Jets all the way through to January. I don't think it's I don't think it's done just by signing Trevor Simeon. Whether they do something bold, like swing a trade for a veteran or continue to sign guys off the street, who can say right now? But I have a feeling we'll be checking in on this at least every few weeks because I just think this turnstile is going to keep spinning and spinning. So we'll see where that goes, but whether it's Zach Wilson or anybody else, not an enviable task taking on the Kansas city chiefs this weekend. All right, let's get into some Thursday night football Packers lions Lambeau field. Clearly somebody at the, somebody at the NFL noted that they need a a few better Thursday night matchups. If you remember last year, a lot of duds on the Thursday night schedule, this one, not so much. We've already seen a really solid Eagles Vikings game on Thursday night earlier this year. I expect this one to be fantastic and another sign of just how far the division has come in a short amount of time. It's, it's wild to think I, I didn't realize this. The lions have won the last three in this series dating back to last year. They swept 
the last iteration of the Aaron Rodgers Packers. They won kind of a meaningless game at the end of the 2021 season. But as somebody who grew up alongside the Favre era Packers and has, you know, begun my career in the NFL alongside the Aaron Rodgers Packers, it's crazy to think of the Detroit Lions having a winning streak in this series. It's probably even crazier to think that as we're recording this Thursday morning, we'll see if the injury reports change anything, but the lions are favored by a point and a half on the road. Obviously that's not a big, big spread, but remember common knowledge says three uh, home field advantage is worth about three points in football. That's typically the way Vegas looks at these things. So if the game's at Lambeau, Vegas is saying on a neutral field, they think the lions are a four to five point favorite in this matchup, which I get it. The lions were the preseason favorite to win this division. It's still hard for me to process. So we'll see how the lions function in the role of favorite, as opposed to their previous role of spoiler. And it looks very favorable for them on paper heading into this. Unfortunately, the, the deal with Thursday night football is always going to be the attrition of injuries and just how hard it is to get up for a football game on three days notice. Lions played the Falcons on Sunday afternoon. Packers played the saints. They both had both played in the same window, both had the same amount of time, but you're still talking about basically three days between when you're getting done with that game and when you're traveling to start this one, the Packers continue to be banged up left tackle, David Bakhtiari, Interior offensive lineman Elton Jenkins, linebacker Devondre Campbell, all ruled out for this game. We'll see what happens with star cornerback Jair Alexander. Wide receiver Christian Watson still make it, waiting to make his debut. Fellow offensive lineman Zach Toms. Running back Aaron Jones. All these guys questionable. I would imagine a questionable design, designation often means you're going to play, but at least some of those guys might sit. So this is something to watch. This could be once again, a really depleted Packers team. The Lions are dealing with stuff as well. Uh, right guard, Halapuli Vit. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to get it in one try. Let's try it again. I'm sorry, Big V. Halapuli Vati Vaitai ruled out the starting right guard. Just call him Big V. Makes everybody's life easier. So not a full strength Detroit offensive line either. Although it sounds like left tackle Taylor Decker is going to play in this game. He's at least going to give it a go. That would move... Pene Sewell back to his regular spot of right tackle left guard. Jonah Jackson is questionable, questionable. So is safety Kirby Joseph. So keep an eye on all of this. As we get closer to game time, I would imagine a few of these guys are going to play, but these are not full strength teams coming into a Thursday game. As you would expect the big thing I want to see, we talked about it last week, heading into the lions Falcons game with Adam Amin. How real is this lions pass rush? They had seven sacks against Atlanta really broke out really a big day. They put Atlanta behind and they were able to rush the passer a lot in the second half of that game, seven sacks on Sunday, as opposed to just one in the previous two games, but sacks can be a deceiving stat. Are those coverage sacks? Are those blown assignments by the offensive line? Is that Desmond Ritter trying to do too much? I wonder how much of it is a production of the Falcons offense being so run oriented and not really preferring to get into a pure drop back game. Cause you go down by two and then eventually three scores in that game. It gets the Falcons out of what they want to do. I don't know how purely productive the Detroit pass rush is PFF pro football focus grades them 22nd overall in pass rush grade ESPN puts them at 25th in the pass rush win rate by team. By the same metrics, Green Bay's offensive line is a top 10 pass blocking group. Got some serious guys out there. Of course, David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins not being part of it is bound to affect that. So something something gives there. I, I don't know how for real this Detroit pass rush is. My guess is that between Matt LaFleur being a really good play caller and the Green Bay offensive line being pretty good and also playing in green Bay where you're not as likely to be worried about crowd noise in crucial third down situations. I'm guessing the Detroit pass rush is not as successful this week as they looked last week, but Hey, that's why they play the games on the flip side. 
The funny thing is the metrics will tell you that Detroit's running game isn't all that inspiring either, but excuse me, running defense isn't all that inspiring, but they looked incredibly inspiring just a few days ago. They absolutely stonewalled the Falcons 2.2 yards per carry B. John Robinson, nothing doing. I believe they finished with 50 yards on the day or, or maybe less than that. If they can do that to green Bay, Jordan love is likely going to be in for at least an intense day, a frustrating day, a day where he's really going to have to be on the screws. Cause I do think the Packers would prefer to have everything funnel through the running game with a young quarterback like this. Aaron Jones might be back for this game. Hopefully for the Packers, he is because it hasn't looked great with AJ Dillon Packers running game. Nothing doing last week against the saints did not look very good. Honestly, the Packers offense, they win the game Packers offense left a lot to be desired on Sunday afternoon, right up until about the last 12 minutes of the game. You get a couple deep shots for, for defensive pass interference. You take advantage of the saints being willing to sing uh, single guys in coverage. Maybe Christian Watson can take advantage of that. If he's able to play in this game, I think the Packers are going to have to trust Jordan love to push the ball a little bit, because my guess is the lions are going to commit a lot of resources to slowing down the run game. And they proved just a few days ago, they can do it if you don't back them off. So I trust Matt LaFleur and Jordan love to have a plan for that, but I do think it's going to be something they have to contend with on the flip side. A, f- a fun thing about matchups like this is both of these teams have played Atlanta in the last two weeks, Detroit's most recent opponent. It was the Packers opponent before that. So we've got, tape and game footage of both of these teams playing common opposition. Packers gave up 211 rushing yards to the Atlanta Falcons in week two. Now, David Montgomery is listed as questionable, the Lions running back, but that's something to watch. I would imagine, I mean, I think everybody that follows the NFL is aware the Packers run defense has not been overly impressive the last couple years. Doesn't look that much better this year so far. They gave up 4.2 yards per carry to Chicago and then Atlanta gashed them for 211. They did slow down New Orleans. They Saints had nothing doing on them, but I do think there's a difference there. We've got three games that suggest that the Saints offensive line is a little bit of a project. They can't pass protect. They haven't been able to find push in the running game across any of their games. Even with the injuries, Detroit's defensive or offensive line, excuse me, is a much different beast. If Decker's back, Panay Sewell's there, I think the Lions are going to find a way to run the ball. And I think if they're consistent at it, Green Bay could be in a lot of trouble. So that's where my head's at. I think this is a really even matchup. One and a half point spread would tell you that that's probably the case. Road favorite Detroit in Lambeau is my one of my favorite storylines of the week. I I can't let that go. I think that's really cool. I picked Green Bay to win this division before the season. I feel really good about where they are, but I just look at this from an injury standpoint. I think the the Lions are in a better spot. I think the Lions are more likely to be able to do what they want to do, which is run the ball on Green Bay to set up other things for Jared Goff to do, whether it's finding Amon Ross St. Brown, whether it's using Sam Laporta, which the Lions have been doing on a regular basis this season. I think being healthier and being more experienced, having a guy like Jared Goff behind a more intact offensive line, I think the Lions are going to be able to execute more of what they want to do. I think this will be the best Thursday night game of the year so far. I really hope I'm right about that. Give me the Lions in a fun one, like 23 to 20, getting the running game going, whether it's David Montgomery or whether they may make it work with Jameer Gibbs and the other guys. I think that'll be what, what they ride to victory. And like I said, I'm not backing off my Packers pick. It's a long, long season. Uh, But I do think, I do think the lions are better positioned to get out of Lambeau field with a win. And if they do, wow, four game winning streak for the Detroit lions. It's definitely not your dad's NFC North. I'm going to bring back a segment that we really liked here at the show last week. And that's the survivor pick. I figure, you know, I, I can't help you win your fantasy matchup. I got drilled last week. Like people think that people who work in NFL media are, are magically really great at fantasy football. Couldn't be further from the truth. I cannot help you win your fantasy matchup, 
But I do think I can help you make informed picks at Survivor. And these days, that seems just as popular as fantasy football. So why not give you some thoughts to mull over as you consider who to pick? Looking at the week four slate, I don't think this is a fun week to get cute. Like there are fun weeks to do that. I did it in week three. Picked the Seattle Seahawks to take care of Carolina. It was stressful for a little bit, but they got it done. I don't think this is the week for that. A lot of tight matchups in the NFL in week four. As I'm recording this, half of the games, so eight of the 16 have a line of three or less. So I mean, eight of eight of 16 are, are seen as near toss-ups by Vegas. In fact, two of those eight are an even line which means Vegas is basically like, I don't know, flip a coin. So that's what you're looking at here. Like you're not going to find very many lopsided matchups. And the ones that are, are incredibly, incredibly obvious. We'll get to that in a minute. There's also, there's a litany of quarterback concerns to consider. Looks like Bryce Young's going to play for Carolina against Minnesota, but we know he has a gimpy ankle. So keep that in mind. Saints are being very coy with Derek Carr's status heading into a division game against Tampa. You might see Jameis Winston there. Jimmy Garoppolo and Anthony Richardson still in concussion protocol as of right now. It looks more like Richardson's going to play for the Colts than Garoppolo, but again, something to watch heading into the weekend. And then there's three really, really obvious ones. Philly's at home against Washington. San Francisco's at home against Arizona. And you've got Kansas City going on the road to take on Zach Wilson and the Jets. I don't think you can go wrong. And depending on how you've played this, I think you have the freedom to to be creative. Hopefully you haven't burned too many heavyweights through the first three weeks of the season. For me, my picks to this point have been Baltimore, the New York Giants, and the Seattle Seahawks. So I feel great about, okay, we're a quarter of the way into the season. I've got no problem burning a Super Bowl contender on Survivor. I don't think you can go wrong. We saw what a great defense did to Sam Howell last week. Buffalo just murked him for nine sacks and five turnovers. We know what Kansas City looked like against the Bears. We know what Zach Wilson looks like throwing the ball. I don't think you can go wrong there. For me, I'm going to go with the 49ers, which maybe sounds crazy because we just saw Arizona upset Dallas literally earlier this week, but I just think the Niners are absolutely loaded. They're at home. They're sound on both sides of the ball and the Cardinals are no longer sneaking up on anyone. If they were beating Dallas by 12 points is going to have Arizona right on San Francisco's radar. I don't see them sleeping for that game. Not with a chance to go to two and zero in the division. Give me the Niners to take care of business. I wouldn't think too hard about this. If you insist on being sneaky, if you have burned through a lot of great teams and you, and you want to try to pull one over on people, I hate myself for saying this, but if I had to think outside the box, I'd probably pick the chargers at home against Las Vegas. That's assuming Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't play and we'll see what happens there. But if it's Brian Hoyer or if it's Aiden O'Connell starting for Vegas, I know it's the Chargers. I know calamity seems to follow them wherever they go, but the Chargers offense has been phenomenal this season. Justin Herbert has yet to turn the ball over. They've been good in the red zone with Kellen Moore. Playing at home probably doesn't mean a whole lot because there's a ton of Raider fans in in Los Angeles, but I just I think they're a much better team and there's a good chance they'll be playing against a lesser quarterback and don't do it. That's don't do it. I'm, I'm telling you right now, you should just pick an easy team. But if I had to think outside the box, I hate myself, but I would ride with the LA chargers. We'll see eventually how that decision ages very quickly. We will see what happens in Packers lions. And we will be back to recap that we've got a full week four preview coming up for you tomorrow. I'm going to talk to Greg Olson. We're going to preview some big matchups in the NFC East. We're going to talk more about dolphins bills. I know we did it today, but I don't care. That matchup's too good to ignore jam pack podcast for you tomorrow. So we'll see what happens at Lambeau and we will be back to break it all down and get you ready for the weekend. I will catch y'all next time.